Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show, this is Tony. Today on the show we have the return of John Haller and it's a very interesting discussion, I can tell you that. Uh, before we get into it, I just want to remind people we do have an A Minute to Midnight Facebook group, which if you want to join it and search for it, it is A Minute to Midnight, spelled M-I-D-N-I-T-E, and it's all separate words, so make sure you type that into the search in Facebook. We also have a community forum on our website, a minute to midnight.com, which is also where we post archives of all our shows, all our current shows, as well as articles. A Minute to Midnight is run 100% by donations, and if you want to help us out, we really appreciate it. And you can do that on our website where we have a donation button. In fact, there's a donation page as well if you want to check that out. Alrighty. Now, without any further ado, let's get into this great interview with John Haller. I want to welcome back to the A Minute to Midnight show, John Haller. Uh, We had John on a few weeks ago, and it was a great show. And so I'm very, very happy to have you back on the show again today, John. So welcome. It's good to be back with you, Tony. I'm sure we're going to have another great show uh, discussion today. There's a lot of things we can cover. Uh, first off, that Davos or Davos World Economic Forum, that was a big thing that happened last week, and uh, and you sent me one particular video which we'll discuss a little bit to do with that, but yeah, maybe you could kick us off where you want to go with that. Each year, the elites of the world gather in Davos, Switzerland, and have a what's called the World Economic Forum. Uh, I think in terms of where we want it, well, where we will see the world going and what people that are the elites and powerful people in the world and the rich and um, where, you know, they, they kind of come together and they talk about things and they have panels and they have discussions and presentations uh, so they and they cover geopolitics. Uh, for example, this year there were a number of geopolitical uh, panels talking about, uh, and I think we'll talk about it a little bit later. There was a panel on old and new empires, and it was interesting to see how that kind of plays into what the the scripture describes as Bible prophecy. They talk about trends like demographic trends and how the world is changing demographically. They talk about economics. Uh, they have interviews with different leaders of the world. Uh, for example, uh, there's a, a there was an interview with King Abdullah of Jordan. There was one with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, it's a I, I doubt that I'll ever attend, but you know Bill Gates is always there. Uh, George Soros, uh, other people that seem to be uh, wanting to control a lot of things. Uh, and they talk about where they're going in the future. I think Bill Gates, for example, did a panel on uh, the future of health. He's big on vaccinations. He's also big into uh, – he's gotten big into farming. He's purchased some huge farms uh, really within a few miles of my ha- – you know, within 15 miles of my house. Uh, he's purchased somewhere close to 10,000 acres of, of prime Ohio farmland. Um, so anyway, so they get together in Davos. It's incredibly expensive. Uh, 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 someone that I know went there, uh, on, they got a media pass and went and they said that their cab fare from Zurich to Davos. And I don't know how far that is was $650. Oh my gosh. They stayed in a village about six miles away from Davos. And each time they took a cab from their village over to the uh, convention center where this was being held, it cost them over three hundred dollars cab fare. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's it's not for the uh, the common folk, uh, but the 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 panels are they're very interesting, especially if you want to uh, to see where things are going. And they and they talk about uh, a lot of a lot of subjects that you know that that play into. Uh, of Bible prophecy and and what the the Bible talks about, what the world will look at at the end times, and 
Um, they even have some panels that uh, the media are excluded from, so we can imagine what's being discussed there. So this year, the big, of course, the big uh, person showing up was uh, President Trump uh, from the United States, and they said that everybody just uh, was standing around waiting for hours to watch Trump come in and deliver his message. And while they hated him, they wanted to see him. Uh, another big topic of discussion, I mean, they had, uh, well, they had Christine Lagarde there, uh, who is, I think she is past head of the World IMF Bank. International Monetary The IMF. Yeah. Yeah. She, and I, I don't, I mean, she may actually be still the head of the IMF. Uh, Christine Lagarde was there talking about a global economic outlook. Uh, they, there was a lot of talk this year about the uh, fourth industrial rev, uh, revolution. Uh, and and where we're going in the world with artificial intelligence and that sort of thing. And that kind of led to that one panel that uh, I had sent you the video uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Harari, who uh, talked about essentially hacking human beings. <laughs> and uh, it was really one of the more frightening. Absolutely. I mean, it seems like, a, it seems like and I, I think you watched it. I mean, it was uh, – at the, at the same time, it was one of the uh, most informative, but also one of the scariest talks I've ever th seen. And I don't, things don't usually bother me that much, but I was just sort of thinking through the implications of that. And maybe it was the the kind of the context of where I've been in the last couple of weeks of my life. Uh, two weeks ago, my sister, older sister, passed away unexpectedly. And I was kind of thinking, like, um, you know, as I as I was at the funeral, the one thing I noticed was her um, her grandchildren, and that everything she you know got to experience with her grandchildren, it's over. I mean, it's just there's no further interaction with her, and and you know, they're three of the well, they're all teenagers now, uh, all of her five grandchildren, and it. And they were very upset, of course, because they were close to her. And it was just like, it was just like, there's all these things that they're going to do in their lives and college and marriage and their own children and that type of thing. And it's just, it'll be done without, without Sally. And, and so I was, but then I was thinking about what is it that Sally's missing? And I suppose I, I had a week where I was, I called it my week of, uh, living out of Ecclesiastes, you know, uh, all is vanity. <laughs> and we're all going to die and it's all over. And, uh, they have a lovely little service for you for an hour and then kind of put what's left of you away. And it's, it, it just was, it was just a week where I was kind of wrestling with those issues. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll be 64 in a few weeks and, uh, I've been meeting with our marketing people here at the, uh, at the law firm, you know, about developing business and that type of thing. And, and I know it, it's something that I have to do uh, and I'll have to work on it till I retire. But then again, I'm thinking like, I see some of my older friends who've retired, they come back to their law firms in this big building where I'm at. And they're, it's like, it's almost like their career didn't exist. You know, everybody's moved on. Uh, they retired and an hour later, people were, you know, measuring their office to make sure their furniture fit in it. Um, so, and I don't want to, I don't want to be dark about it, but you know, you, it was just, it was it, in the context of all those things going on, uh, in the death of my sister. And then you go to Davos where everybody is talking about almost everything at that, at that forum is about the future. Uh, you know, for example, they had sessions on mapping the Arab world, mapping Southeast Asia, uh, the geopolitical map in 2030. 2030 seems to be a, a year that everybody uh, looks at of great importance. You know, the, there's the 2030 agenda at the UN and all that's played out at the World Economic Forum. Saudi Arabia rolled out a new website and things that they're going to do to develop business with the Saudi Arabian 2030 agenda. So it's just, it's a fascinating thing to watch. Fascinating thing to watch. 
Now, yeah, you, that um, histori- historian that you mentioned, I think he's, that's what he's called, a historian, Yuval Harari, he's actually from mm-hmm. Israel. Um, and boy, he yeah, he said some scary stuff, all right. Uh, mm-hmm. Organisms are algorithms. Okay, now mm-hmm. the, the guy is gay and he's pushing basically a godless kind of agenda of that. Um, and he says that algorithms will end up monitoring everything. And this, this is word for word what he said in one piece of it. This is now about to change. Science is now replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds, but our intelligent design. And the intelligent design of our clouds, the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, these are the new driving forces of evolution. And at the same time, science may enable life, after being confined for 4 billion years to the limited realm of organic compounds, science may enable life to break out into the inorganic realm. I mean, that's scary stuff. Yeah, and the, and the thing was, uh, he when he went through the Q&A session, uh, both with the, the moderator of his session and a later uh, Q&A session that he was moderated by somebody else, and he comes off as a very nice guy. It's just, you know, these are things that I'm thinking about. These are things that I notice that are going on. Uh, and so, and then a lot of times people say is, I, I don't know, I don't know the answers. I just know where I'm going now. It's, it's interesting if you understand his background, you, you mentioned he is gay and he, he mentioned that, uh, I think he used an example in his talk of, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could, uh, use an algorithm at a party to figure out what people really are, you know, like, are they really gay? Are they really transgender? And he, and it was just sort of it was the um, I was just sort of struck at so, the casual nature of he was talking about these sc- pretty scary ideas. His expertise, his his he's an historian, and his expertise is medieval history. And there was one I don't have the exact quote in front of me. I'll probably play it in the prophecy update I do at church this week because I I just didn't, there was so much. That happen, happens during Davos week that it, I try to pick up on the major themes and uh, I wanted to go into his in more detail. But he made this quote about in, in, in medieval society, you had, of course, you had the lords of the manor and you had the serfs and the serfs had a miserable existence but even in medieval society, the serfs at the lowest end of the social scale, social and economic scale, they provided a service. He said, we're very getting, getting very close to the place where if, if you can't contribute to this data-driven, science-driven society and culture, we're going to have to essentially. We're going to have to decide what we're going to do with you, uh, because you'll be used. You're useless at some point. And, and now, he said it in sort of a offhanded way. But I'm I'm sitting there thinking like, <clears throat> that's scary stuff. Uh, this is this is changing the whole. This I mean the while he talked about science the issues that he was really talking about were theological in nature and they were big theological questions. So as he talked about, I mean, you mentioned the right organisms or algorithms yet when somebody asked him a question about intelligent design, I think in the Q and a session, the second Q and a session, his session was titled, will the future be human? Then his Q and a session was called questioning the future uh, in that session, somebody asked him a question about intelligent design. And so here's this guy. He's clearly secular. Uh, I think he's just Jewish by ethnicity or culture. And I think I think he would probably say he's an atheist. And he talked about how all these algorithms are being discovered that can train all this data, can predict and be used to control everything. 
but he doesn't sort of take the step back to how did all those things come into existence? Where did they come from? And it, it's, it's always so interesting to watch um, non-Christian religious people. And I think he is a very religious person. He just doesn't know it. His religion is science. You know, he's talking about these, these huge issues um, and he can't take the, the next leap to see that there's a, an intelligent designer called God behind all of this. It's a pretty, it's a pretty stunning thing to watch. But the scary thing is that he thinks that humans are going to, are going to control this. Now, for someone who's a, a medieval period historian as himself, he should know that the people that controlled things back in those days weren't very nice people yeah. by and large. It was a pretty miserable time to be alive if you weren't part of the elite. So I guess he just sort of operates on the assumption that he will be part of the elite. And while he projected that, uh, that one question asked of him was, well, when do you think all of this big change is going to come about? And he said, certainly uh, soon, uh, decades. And then the question was asked, well, can we, can we go back and not, can we go back and can we unring the bell? Uh, can we put the genie back in the bottle? And he said, no, the genie is out of the bottle on artificial intelligence. Um, it's coming. It's going to come. There might be a country here or there that says we're going to try to put the genie back in the bottle. But, you know, the nature of computer technology and that type of thing is that it's distributed far and wide. So one country is going to say, well, we're going to do it. Uh, so he talked about. Uh, there were other panels that talked about the fact that the one country that has really started to implement this, well, there were really two that were mentioned, uh, was uh, China and the way they're using algorithms and, and you know, they'll, they'll use it for control of people. Um, I don't know if you saw it. There was a TV show here in the U.S. called uh, Person of Interest uh, that was on for, I think, probably four or five years. And it talked about how they would use predictive intelligence to the whole premise of the show was they had a giant computer that told them, you know, you need to go work with this person because they're going to be the victim of a crime uh, or this person go stop this person because they're going to commit a crime. Well, this is what China wants to do to control people. So China was the one country that they said was into the big data driven control society. And the other one they said what he mentioned was Israel. I spent a couple of weeks at Israel last spring. We spent a lot of time in Judea and Samaria, the, the portion of Israel that's called the West Bank. And I will tell you that I, it became very apparent to me uh, that uh, somebody was seeing everything that I did, <laughs> did all the time while I was in Israel. Uh, there are cameras and everything all over the place. We we stayed in a – some friends provided an apartment for us in a very nice building right next – almost adjacent to the old city. And there was a security guard, and he had all these monitors and everything. And one day in the parking garage, I, I went the wrong way in the parking garage, and I went down like six – around the corner and turned around and came back. And when I came back, the security guard had come down – two stories into the underground parking garage. And he was saying, uh, I noticed you were driving the wrong direction. Is everything okay? And I was thinking like, there's no, and you know, when we went to Hebron, uh, which is probably the most divided city. And I may have talked about that a little bit on the last time we got together. Uh, as we were going through the no man's land where they divided Hebron uh, about 23 years ago, the Israeli soldiers were there in armored vehicles putting up and adjusting cameras uh, that were watching all of no man's land. So everywhere we went, I felt like I was being watched. You get used to it, I guess, but um, the notion of privacy is kind of a, a lost concept. And so Hariri in his talk, um, I think in the Q&A session 
done by the, the lady anthropo- she her background was anthropology but she's a f- editor for the financial times and she said uh, it used to be that if if we had something that other people wanted we would sell it to them but the where someplace we reached reached a tipping point where we now give away all of our data for free. Uh, and we, when we go to these websites and we click on these websites, I, I was just ordering a product for a new computer I bought. And I thought, well, I'll just check Facebook real quick while I'm here. So I flip over to Facebook and there's an ad for the thing that I had just yeah. been looking at on another website. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it wasn't an ad for a similar product. It was an ad for the exact same product that I had been looking at. And I even had closed down my browser and reopened it. So the notion of privacy is something. And so so what happens, and I know a little bit about this because it's part of the area that I practice law in a little bit, is, you know, every time you go and you sign up for something, there is a, a click agreement, you know, accept the terms of this agreement, or you agree to these terms if you're going to use this website, like Facebook and whatever. And essentially, you're signing away your rights to all your data. Well, now what happens is, so now there's this massive amount of data that's collected on you. I, I don't think they have time to watch everything that you do. But the question then becomes, well, who's controlling the data and what are they going to do with it? And is it always going to end up in, in good hands? And, and Hariri's response to the question was, well, I hope so, you know, but there's no guarantee. Now, you know, Tony, we know from a Bible prophecy standpoint that actually Bible prophecy is a pattern. And what happened before in scripture sets the pattern for what will happen in the future. So the first massive rebellion against God occurred at Babel, collective human rebellion, I guess I would call it. And one of the the things there was that uh, God saw what they were doing and said, you know, they'll think that nothing is impossible for them. And it, it got bad enough that God had to intervene. He confused the languages to get away from that collective human desire to, you know, we shall be as gods. Well, that was the pattern of the first rebellion against God. It will be that it will be recapitulated, and it will be the pattern for the last rebellion against God before God intervenes. And I have to tell you that as I look and study these things, um, I I think we're there. (laughs) I mean, I I just have to think we're there because especially when when you listen to the theological implications of Hariri, and what Hariri said right at the end of his panel, too, was, they said, well, how was this, how is everybody, how are they going to get control of all this? What are they going to do to get everybody to be on board with this? And he said, it'll be through healthcare. Uh, you give us your data and we'll make you live a longer and better life. And everybody will go along with that. And when you look at all of the things where the transhuman movement, artificial intelligence, and that type of thing, uh, the ultimate goal of all of that was put on a cover of Time magazine probably six years ago now. I, uh, I, use, it, 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 I use it in sort of my, one of my stock slides in the presentations that I do about prophecy, and it was – The title of Time magazine was 2045. There was a picture of a human being with some electrodes coming out of its neck. 2045, the year man becomes immortal. Yeah. And this is is the goal of all of this. This is, I mean, if if this isn't a recapitulation of what happened at Babel 
and really happen on it happened there on steroids. I don't I don't know what is. And, well, the th- and so you can I just and um just put something in sure. there when you when you actually look at who the people are, the type of people behind a transhumanist movement. And you were saying, you know, about, oh, well, who's going to have the control in the end? Well, if you look at their mentality, for example, here's a quote from a transhumanist intellectual whose name is Max Moore. And he said this, God, being the well-documented sadist that he is, no doubt wanted to keep Lucifer around so he could punish him and try to get him back under his, that's God's power. Probably what really happened was that Lucifer came to hate God's kingdom and his sadism, his demand for slavish conformity and obedience, his psychotic rage at any display of independent thinking and behaviour. Lucifer realised that he could never fully think for himself and could not act on his independent thinking so long as he was under God's control. Therefore he left heaven, that terrible spiritual state ruled by the cosmic sadist Jehovah and was accompanied by some of the angels. That tells you the kind of people, and there's another one, Ray Kurzweil's another one, uh, you know, uh, you know, these people, yeah. that that's their mindset. These are the people that are pushing the transhumanist agenda and that, certainly lines up with the whole, you know, well, book of Revelation. I see it coming out in this, and that's why, I, to be per- perfectly honest, I believe that the Mark of the Beast is not just going to be some, you know, RFID chip. I think it's going to be something far more than that. It's going to be a DNA-altering chip. Well, that's uh, a premise that uh, a friend of mine named Doug Hamp um, has written on. I don't know if you've ever no, I, I don't that, know him. that he's had to say. Um, Doug Camp, you can find him on Facebook, and he, he's written a book on it. And that that's that's been his premise <clears throat> for some time that there will be some kind of DNA altering thing, and and that's um, and, and and so then you get into the question of it, what comes out on the other side is the, is that human or not? Uh, I saw a report just fl- I don't know I. You know, people send me so much stuff anymore. It's hard for me to keep track of where everything comes from. But um, that they had actually some, I I might have been on Drudge Report. They had actually created a sort of a clone of human chimpanzee DNA. And they had to, they killed it because they they just didn't know what they've scared. It scared them <laughs> as to yeah. what they had done. Uh, oh, here it is. Uh, this is a claim that's made. Uh, see if I – well, it's in the sun in the UK, so we have to filter for that. But uh, inside the bizarre world of the human chip hybrids known as humanzies, a renowned scientist claims one was born in Florida lab before being killed by panic do- doctors. Um so who knows? I mean, that's in the sun. So, <laughs> but yeah. I don't know. It, men, the Men in Black movie said that that you know the tabloids are the ones that you really should look at because they're the ones that are telling you the truth. Um, but, but 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 back to Harari's talk. I don't know. It's one of the most important talks I think I've ever heard, just because it, because of the sort of calm. This is what's coming. This is inevitable. We can't stop this, and we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the nature of his talk was just frightening. And, and when you add on to this and then sort of juxtaposed on top of that was the, uh, um, and I, I don't study that this much, but the Illuminati fest that took place with the Grammy awards, uh, at Madison square garden in New York Sunday night was just in the, the symbology that they, you know, the symbols that they use there are just unmistakable that it's, a cult and satanic. The, this is, to be honest, I, I, I this is why I just can't buy into the people believe that Islam is going to be the world religion and that the Antichrist will be religious, the Islamic. I just can't see it. I, I just think that this is going to supersede, transcede all religions that we know when it comes down to it. And it's not going to be something like Islam. We've got this whole transhumanism thing and the artificial intelligence. Uh, and that is where we're going, not to an outdated religion like Islam. Islam will just be incorporated into the whole thing, and the uh, yeah, well, that, that's how I yeah. see it. 
yeah, I think it is. I think it's, um, you know, we always want to divide things into, or I see this happen a lot in people who analyze things for Bible prophecy. And, and I do it too. So when I say this as a criticism, it's something that I've done too. So someone will, they'll adopt a particular view. Maybe it's the, a pre-trib rapture or a post-trib rapture. Yeah. Or they will adopt a view about the Antichrist. He has to come from Europe, uh, or he's Jewish. Or well, he's an Assyrian, so or whatever, yeah. Yeah, and and so I think that um, I sort of take the position that, you know, I, I sort of have views that I think are, you know, that's that's an acceptable view, and it may play out that way. But, you know, Hal Lindsey wrote a book, 40 almost 50 years ago now, uh, like Great Planet Earth. And he posited some things about you know, a European Antichrist and a revived Roman Empire and the European common market. And it, and as I said, it, it may play out that way, but I think it's going to be much broader and more comprehensive than it was. And, and the one thing about pro- prophetic scriptures is that they unfold in an existing moment, a geopolitical yeah. context in the world. It's not, uh, and so, and so the, the tendency of people, and look, I'm a lawyer and, uh, one of the hardest things to do as a lawyer is because of the way our judicial system works is you collect data on a case and evidence, and then you present your best side and the other presents their best sides and attacks your presentation, you attack theirs. And then somebody tries, there's a trier fact to figure it out. What is so very hard for lawyers, and I fight it all the time, is to believe everything your client tells you <clears throat> or believe, believe your own pleadings and then interpret all evidence through those pleadings. So, for example, if you have a grid that says that the Antichrist is Jewish, uh, you will interpret all evidence that you see through that grid and come to the conclusion that, you know, Benjamin Not- Netanyahu is the Antichrist or Jared Kushner or whoever is a important Jewish person at the time. And I think that um, I think we need to be very, very careful in doing that. And there's a scripture. There's a, there's passages of scripture in Daniel 11 and 12 that talk about that, that, uh, you know, Daniel was told, Daniel, seal up the book until the time of the end. Now that that kind of tells me. And then Jesus is quoting from Daniel uh, when he does the all of the discourse. It, it tells me that Daniel's going to be a really important book in the end, especially on the geopolitical side. But it talks about the fact there that uh, people, and one of the things that's talked about in Daniel 12, 4, I think is uh, uh, People will run to and fro and knowledge will increase. Now, one way I think a valid interpretation of that is general knowledge will increase. And boy, look at the knowledge and data and everything available to us. I mean, listen, I mean, look at this. We're You're sitting on the other side of the world talking to me like you're sitting right next to yeah. me. And so knowledge and all that stuff and technology, I think that's part of it. But the other part of it is I think that going back into and f- going to and fro is people going to and fro through scripture. And then it says, and the wise will understand and instruct others. And so I've, I've done some talks on that. Uh, I did a talk, um, it was about a year ago, uh, Thanksgiving weekend in Bakersfield called the masculine. You can find it out there on the internet, the masculine that there will be these people in the end times that God will put in place that will understand. They'll be like the sons of Iskar who were wise and praised because they understood the times. They'll be like the Bereans who always searched the scriptures to think if these things were so, even when they're listening to the apostles. So we need to understand that, you know, maybe our speculation and everything is, is limited until we get right in that time. And so, you know, I, I do think we're, getting almost right in that time with the speed with which everything is changing. So I think we need to be, I always say, make sure all your prophecy charts and that type of thing are in 
uh, easily editable format uh, because I I think things will change. And so I, I, I try not to be too dogmatic. I agree. About, yeah, because, you know, so. people easily pigeonhole themselves into one view, like that. The, there's a lot of people that believe Barack Obama's the Antichrist and that you couldn't tell them anything other than Barack Obama being the Antichrist still. And there well, and are I those still, that are, get emails. Yeah, I still get emails from some of those people too. Yeah, and, 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 and then there's the Pope Francis. Every you know, Pope Francis is the false prophet. Now what happens if Pope Francis dies, you know, or whatever? Or the Vatican, the the Antichrist is going to arise from the Vatican, or the Antichrist is Islamic, or whatever I could name a whole heap, you know, but right. Uh, to me, yeah, you just look at the whole thing is that people are, are taking these views based on a, the current time frame, but we don't know what's going to play out exactly in the next few years. It could change the whole picture, uh, and I, I, this is why I believe this whole transhumanism and singularity and artificial intelligence is going to play a huge role in it. And you mentioned the Illuminati you know, the media fest, that's been playing into this whole thing for so long now, uh, educating people, uh, you know, and, and brainwashing people into accepting all this. So to me, they or some, you know, group with you, uh, rather than call them the Illuminati, Illuminists, the Illumined Ones, as they call themselves, these elite, they are the ones behind what's going on. And and I just think people need to be flex, somewhat flexible because things don't necessarily fit the picture that we think they're going to. I mean, it's changed a lot in a few years, and, and it, we don't know exactly what's going to change uh, in the next few years. But certainly what you've said, the genie's out of the bottle, you can't put it back, and the transhumanism and you know the artificial intelligence thing is going to play a big role in that. And I and I look at the fact that in the Book of Revelation, those that take the mark of the beast, you know, they're tossed into the lake of fire without question. So what is it about those people that's different than every other people before? Is it just because they take a Lowry FID chip, or is it that somehow the people that take the mark of the beast, knowing full well what they're doing, are actually becoming something other than fully human, and therefore they aren't redeemable? Well, it's certainly that that is a, a distinct possibility, and I and I also think that it's just not the chip. It's that there's a there's a huge religious component to it, sort of a uh, blaspheming God part to it that I think plays into it. I've thought that for some time, that it's 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 not just, you know, look, when I was, you know, I'm 63. Well, can I just, I just want to. Be, it just, used to be a barcode. Now it's, you know, we've gone way beyond that. Well, I just want to add something to what you've just said, because and I've used the same scripture on the show many times. It says in Revelation 13, 4, and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him. But the fact is they worship the dragon. So you're right, there will be a worship thing, and I actually personally believe that it's going to be Luciferian ultimately. In the end of the day, Satan, Lucifer, is not going to be content to be called Allah or some other name. You know, he's going to, be, he's going to want to know who they're worshipping, you know, that they're worshipping him. People are going to know, mm -hmm. and when he and when he's cast down uh, from heaven, he knows his time is short, and he's going to pull out all the stops. So there, there's always this component: is that there's this. I don't know if I, you know, I call I talk about convergence of all these things that are happening, and there's an acceleration. Uh, there's a velocity to the way things will happen. And, and you know, as I watch things, and, and I have, you know, friends who talk on these topics a lot too, they're always talking about the fact that everything's happening so fast. You now, how, how did this happen? Where, where, where did we come along? And how did it happen? How did we get here? And uh, it's just, I think it's part of the nature of the times in which we live. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yep. So I have a friend named Patrick Wood uh, who's written on it uh, and speaks on issues of technocracy, which he thinks is the big component as to how all of this plays out. 
And, you know, when, when Patrick started talking about this, and it's probably been six or seven years that I first met Pat ago that I met Patrick. So Patrick was talking about technocracy many years ago, and it was sort of like, yeah, right. You know, I don't know why you're talking about this. Uh, but, you know, he goes back and traces it through some of the, the groups that have been kind of pushing these things and Bilderbergs and all this thing. And, and I think he's right. And, you know, we're sort of at the time where it seems to be playing out. And, and one of the places it plays out each year is Davos. And it would be interesting to go back and look at the topics that they were talking about Davos two or three years ago, uh, because it just each year this technology aspect of geopolitics becomes bigger and bigger. And, and, and look, Tony, what you said about Islam, you know, I think Islam is an important part of all this. Uh, I noticed that the people on the left can't seem to think, see anything wrong with it. Yeah. Uh, they, they seem to go along with it. They seem to be united because I think they're, they're both about control. And these are the people that want to be in control of the technology. And now you have the, the country uh, where uh, the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salam, will soon take on the title as the uh, custodian of the holy places of Mecca and Medina. But now the big, and one of the big things rolled out at Davos this year was Saudi Arabia's push for their technocracy aspect, their 2030 development of technology, this massive city that they want to build there Neil. along yeah. the Red Sea that will kind of unite uh, Jordan and Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And, so even Islam is into this. But your you thing know, is, like, I um I did a a, a, sh a video on this a while ago. But one thing that you know with Muhammad bin Salman is that he was trying to get rid of the radical form of Islam, and he wanted Neom to be a place where all religions can be comfortable. So this is very suspect, in my opinion. Uh, I think Neom is going to be a very big player in the days ahead so i'm really interested to hear what you have to say about the saudi arabian aspect but to me again he's not got he's coming from a position ostensibly anyway of making people you know comfortable and getting rid of the radical aspect of the islamic faith so is it just to be incorporated into this one one religious system luciferian system but he can't do it all in one go you know, you don't. We don't really know where he's at, but perhaps he's not fundamentally Islamic himself. But he's still got to actually come across that way. He may just be a Luciferian. Well, I mean, I think uh, uh, that religion lends itself to that. If uh, I'm sure we can get some hate mail going on that. But uh, because of its its very nature and and where it came from, and uh, I, I I do think it has its roots in in a very evil dark place, and so it, it's never it's never going to separate itself from the roots. So you know I I'm having trouble figuring that out. And and Tony, this is <laughs> this is such a crazy time to be alive because I have friends, Christian friends who are convinced of their particular view as to what's going on in the world. And their view is 180 degrees from other Christian friends that I have are convinced that their view of the mm. world is correct. Also, I, I'll use the example. I mean, um, there's a thing going around right now. There's a I mean, some I, some people will say it's conspiracy theory. Some people will say it's the actual truth uh, about a thing, a guy named QAnon who's posting these kind of cryptic messages on these uh, bulletin boards and some are getting onto Twitter and he's, and so some are saying, oh, this is just a, a big CIA psyop that is trying to mislead people and show how they can control people and others say, no, this is true. This is what's actually going on. And so the people who said this is true and what's going on, that uh, Mueller, who was appointed a special counsel to investigate the Russian connection to the Trump administration or the Trump campaign, is 
he and Trump are secretly working together and they're taking down all of these elites and there's 10,000, I saw a number yesterday, 13,000 sealed indictments and all these people are going to be arrested and they're going to be thrown into Guantanamo prison and and Trump is, Trump, and, and they're giving Trump sort of messianic qualities. Yeah. Then on the other side, people say, no, Trump is fighting the deep state and Mueller is part of the deep state and he's still working to take Trump down. And you can't have both of these things be true. I mean, and it's, and I, I sort of feel like I'm sitting here in the middle watching this, people who are thoroughly convinced of their worldview and trying to figure out myself what's real and what's not real. And I, I think, you know, look, the thing Jesus warned about more than anything else that we had to be careful of in the end times was deception. And it's going to be, it's going to be deception that when you look through, if you take that and then you, you use that as a filter to look at a lot of these scriptures Deception is layered on top of all these things. So you're going to have deception in geopolitics. You're going to have deception in religion. You're going to have deception in every area of life. And Jesus warns, don't let anyone deceive you. And I think it's a time where we need to be really, really careful about what we run uh, run off and say, this is absolutely true. Uh, so this whole thing with this, this Trump thing is like this, you know, like, you know, the, I feel like the uh, reporter standing there, you know, the hurricane coming down on the boardwalk on the beach and they're out there trying to keep from being blown over talking about it. And I, I kind of feel like this is, we're, we're in the midst of this storm. Um, and so it's, it's, it's one time it's kind of, it's kind of frightening and it's kind of exciting and I just don't know how it's all going to play out. I, I can pretty much assure you, if people are telling you that there are 13,000 sealed indictments, that I will be shocked if that's true. Uh, I mean, I'm a lawyer. I know what it takes. I handled one of the largest fraud cases in the history of the United States, uh, criminal fraud cases. And <laughs> um, to get an indictment takes a lot of work and sometimes years. It was It was years after a big financial collapse before the people involved in the case I was uh, representing some men were indicted. And, and it took hundreds of witnesses at the grand jury. It took dozens and dozens of FBI agents and U.S. attorneys to investigate. So they get 13,000 indictments in a short period of time. It's just, it's just not possible. It's just not going to happen. And there's no buzz in the legal community about it. But everybody's running around like this number is true. Uh, and, and I, I don't it buy it. I don't buy it either, to be honest. I, you know, look, I, I, here's what I say. I hope it's true and send me one to show me the indictment. And nobody's ever sh- – and show me the methodology that you used to come up with that number. And I, somebody gave me a list of cases, so I went. I, you can look at all the do- – and I went through a dozen cases and not a single one of them had anything to do with – pedophilia investigations or money, you know, it, it, they were civil cases in which a sealed document had been filed. And that happens all the time these days. I think there's a, I'm discovering that there's a, a, a huge arm of people that are just so narrow focused that Donald Trump is some sort of, you know, well, some of them are almost messianic in the way they see him. Others are not that extreme, but that they think that he is God's anointed and doing something that they, the more I research it, there's real mixture there. It's, uh, and, 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 <laughs> and he's exactly not, right. you know, you, and to be honest, I've had people basically say that, you know, virtually God will shut down our ministry because I'm not, because I'm not on the Trump bandwagon that I dare question Whereas all you know we're trying to do is get to the truth, not be pro-Trump or anti-Trump, but get to the truth. Because as you've mentioned, there's so much deception, and deception is what's going to play out in these end days. And you just look at people who are the friends, you know, 
Donald Trump himself has called Henry Kissinger a great friend, great longtime friend. Henry Kissinger is also great longtime friends with David Rockefeller, Evelyn de Rothschild, Hillary Clinton, um, John McCain, etc., etc. So how is that? And, you know, there's just, well, I could go on. I've made videos on it. I better not just rehash what I've already no, done. Uh, it, it, let, let me tell you, if you ever come to Ohio, I'll take you up to, um, a friend of mine told me this. And he said, just go check it out and, and tell me what you think. And so I, uh, Ohio is known as the mother of presidents. Uh, eight presidents uh, out of the 45 came from the state of Ohio. And one of them was... Um, uh, William McKinley, I grew up in the uh, first 15 years of my life in Canton, Ohio. So William McKinley was from Canton, Canton, Ohio. He was president from 1896 to 1901. But he has this giant uh, mausoleum. It's a huge, It's one of the largest, probably the second largest mausoleum dedicated to a, a – he was assassinated um, in 1901. And he's buried there, and I've been to it. And – I, I didn't know at the time the the symbology that's involved in that, and he was a mason. I mean, it's pretty clear. But up the road in Cleveland, Ohio, is the largest presidential mausoleum. It's for a guy named James Garfield, uh, who was president um, 1800, 1801, 1881, I think. And uh, just for a short time, because he was he was also assassinated, and he's got this giant mausoleum, circular mausoleum with a pointed top in this uh, Lakeview Cemetery in Cleveland Heights on the east, east side of Cleveland. And uh, so I went to it and I go down in the, uh, the, in the basement, you go walk down and there's like a little museum of things and the, in the floor, Tony, there are uh, swastikas in the tile floor. <laughs> and then there's a, there's a room there and then they have his casket laying there with a, the casket of he and his wife with a flag draped over it. It's, it's kind of those see-through bricks. Uh, you know, you can look right in on it. It's almost, you could reach out and touch it. And, uh, and then you look in the corner, there's a little display case. And in the corner, there's a schematic of the, the uh, architectural, conception of what this building was and really what it was was this pointed top it was a it was the core of a pyramid is what it was and the the, the drawing is right there and and this this guy was a uh, disciples of christ minister garfield he was a lawyer um and he was a mason i mean it, it's clear and then you you right down over the hill from him this was a largely Baptist cemetery at the time that came on. And what, what's all over the cemetery? All the tombstones are obelisks. Yeah. And just down the hill, uh, you know, you probably throw a, a rock from the back of uh, the mausoleum down and hit the tallest obelisk in the cemetery which is the obelisk over the grave of the great Baptist, John D. Rockefeller. It, and it, it's just, it's, it's one of these things that you just don't um, think about. And, and, and so I, I'm not a big uh, conspiracy theory guy myself. I know that there are evil people. I know that there are evil people that want to control things and that uh, they've been trying this for a long time. And when, when it's time, God will, but they're not very good at it. They're just not very, good. they're not very good at it in some respects. But at some point, God will sort of pull back whatever restriction is on them, and they'll be able to do this. Um, and they'll, and they'll, they have every, I mean, they've been working on it for a long time. But it's just kind of interesting because you, you think of Rockefeller, he was a Baptist, you know, but then you go to his grave and it's clear that, no, that's not really what was important to him. You know, you go to the grave of Garfield, you go to the grave of McKinley. It's just, it's very, uh, it's very eerie, you know, that this happens and you just don't realize, uh, and you, and you grow up in the culture and you don't realize, I mean, everybody loved William McKinley in Canton, Ohio. Well, anyway, back to Davos, you know, but I think it's important and it ties in because 
you know, there, there's always been these plans going on in the background. And now what's happening is that uh, I, I think we're getting close to that time because now one of the things that they've never really had was the technology to really, really control and alter things. And so when you listen to Hariri and you listen about what's going to happen in the end times in Revelation 13 and looking back at what happened at Babel, it's it's really that we're there. And it's, um, boy, it's a, I have to tell you that I, I, was, I was just sort of uh, gobsmacked when I sat there and listened to Hariri's talk. And the calm nature with which with which you gave it about how people it, they're they're going to control the data. Who controls the data? I think controls humanity. And even he says, "What is human?" And at the time he's saying that, in the background is an image which is clearly a sort of fuzzy image of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that, I sent you that picture, yeah, that screenshot. Yeah. And it, it ought to freak, I mean, it ought to freak us out in a way that uh, we need to have our guard up because the levels of deception that are going to be coming on this world uh, are going to be stunning. And I want to be one of those guys that Daniel talks about, that the wise will understand and instruct the others. And I do think that there are people today that are, that are going to fall into that category if they're not already there. And the only way we can do that is by staying rooted in scripture and, but also being aware and understanding the times in which we live. I think that's right. And I, and I think people need to be very wary of the fact that there is um, an occultic sort of view that is as above, so below, as within, so without, and opposites, Hegelian dialectic, left and right, and don't fall into the camp of one extreme or the other because that's exactly where they want you. That's how they will get the chaos that they, they need in the end to bring uh, the, the order out of the chaos. So, yeah, we've got to keep ourselves grounded in the word ultimately. Um, and, and John, um, it's been really awesome talking to you about this today. Maybe a good way to finish would be for you actually to pray for our listeners, perhaps uh, for those that don't know Christ, that can come to know him, and also uh, that, you know, that we will have wisdom. Sure. I'll be glad to do that. Father, we live in such interesting times, and I'm so grateful that you left us a book, books, written by prophets thousands of years ago that describe the times in which in which we live and that we can use to study those books and those words to understand the deep theological issues that are facing us. And Father, I just pray that for those of us uh, who are believers, that you will infuse us with your spirit, give us wisdom, Give us discernment so we can uh, understand what's coming and warn others. And that you will also use it as an opportunity for us to be able to tell others that they need their only hope, their only answer, ultimately, is uh, faith in Jesus Christ. That is the only way to salvation. That is the only way to assure your future. It won't be in... Um, some miraculous health cure, uh, but that it will be only through faith in Jesus Christ that we'll be able to assure our eternity. We just pray that you'll give us those opportunities, pray that you'll make people inquire about those. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, um, John. It's been really great discussion, and um, I'm sure it will, won't be too long before we have you back again because uh, these are always really fascinating discussions when we get to chat. Well, so we'll have you again yeah. soon. Okay, thanks a lot, Doug. Maybe next time we can get to the second topic on the list that we talk about ahead of time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, awesome. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh-huh. Bye. Folks, you can find all of our shows on iTunes, on YouTube, 
and also on our website a minute to midnight.com which you may want to actually follow our website and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Remember we do run this completely by donations and thank you to those that will help us out. We greatly appreciate it. I write, play and record all the music in our shows as well. So that's about it for today. On behalf of the A Minute to Midnight team, this is Tony signing out. God bless. Have a great week.